motion has been posted in the court. Is the mic on? You good? Okay. Pretty much sound? Okay. And I see that there are no, no sign-ups for any uh, comments on the agenda items. So we will then uh, invitation. Yeah. All right. And I'll turn it over to Mr. G. All right. Good evening. Can everybody hear me all right? Okay. All right. Um, I want to first thank you all for being here. Uh, you know, getting people to, to, to volunteer time is getting to be a uh, commodity that we, we don't have a whole lot of much of anymore. And so I appreciate your, you dedicating the time to be here tonight uh, for this very, very important meetings that we're going to be having. Um, we have been conducting, since I came into the district four and a half years ago, the spring that I was here, I came in in uh, December 2018, and in the spring of 2019, we started doing comprehensive needs assessments through all of our departments, our curriculum, our uh, student uh, uh, special programs for, for our students, maintenance, IT, uh, fac facilities, all kinds of things that we've been working towards. And we've covered a lot of things. and, and Mr. Gadbois is going to address some of those things tonight, but we've kind of gotten to a point where we need to continue on with our facilities planning and what we do for the next steps. And that's kind of why we're calling these, these meetings over the next few weeks to sit there and address some of that stuff. So once again, thank you for being here. I'm not gonna talk too long. I'm just gonna introduce the guy who's gonna do the presentation tonight. And this is Mr. Robert Gadbois. He is with Older Owners, <laughs> Owner Builders Resource, sorry who we've been working with and consulting with. He is an engineer, civil engineer. Um, we've been utilizing them with our roofs, with our, the, our projects that we've been doing uh, and looking at our facilities assessments. And he will go over all of that and I'm gonna turn it over to him. So up to you. Thank you, Mr. G. Since you told me I had to be done in three hours, that was, I appreciate you being short there. Uh, no, folks, there has been a lot of work going on. This is the culmination of about three years worth of effort um, but we've gotten to the point now where we need your feedback we need you as stakeholders as taxpayers as parents as grandparents and just citizens of, of Kennedale to give us your feedback on what's important to you and how your your school district should should serve the the students of Kennedale um, talk a little bit about your charge um, you guys are in, in a There we go. Okay. Um, your role is advisory, and it's an important advisory role to the school board. Uh, you represent your community, you represent the schools, you represent the kids, you represent your neighbors, and as we share the data with you, your feedback is going to be important as we formulate options, uh, opportunities, and address priorities on the things that we're looking at addressing district-wide. And ultimately, we hope you play an important role in helping us formulate uh, recommendations to give to the school board uh, in the near future. So it's very important that you're here. We appreciate your time. We appreciate all the inputs that you guys can share with us. I'd like to take a little bit of time, as Mr. G said, and just kind of talk through some of the things that have happened over the last three years. Um, as you know, with as building a buildings age, there are ongoing things that need to be addressed, just from a maintenance perspective, wear and tear, that type of thing. But as curriculum change changes and instruction changes, and our beloved legislature comes together every biennium and comes up with great new ideas, some of the criteria that districts are bound by and guided by in terms of how they educate children changes as well. And that has an impact on, on the facilities. Uh, but over the last three years, the district has, has taken the initiative and with uh, Mr. G and the leadership of the school board have taken money out of fund balance, have taken money out of their maintenance and operation budget to address a wide range of infrastructure and staffing needs throughout the district. And I want to go through some of those. Specifically, when you think about safety, uh, security, and of course, this is pre some of the tragedies that have happened in, in recent years. You look at other improvements around the district specific to safety and security, the district has spent almost $800,000 over the last three years addressing a wide, a wide range of needs across the district. In addition to that, you know, I, I always tell the story of when um, I, 
cleaned out my parents' house and I found this little blue handprint clay that I made in 19... And um, that was big-time instruction in kindergarten in the early 60s. Now, by state law, those kids from the time they're in kindergarten to the time they graduate, they have their hands on keyboards. Technology and science and math are integrated throughout their instructional model from kindergarten forward. And so it's changed a lot. And so the district has, has stayed ahead of the curve, I think, in some ways, and continues to strive to do that in terms of technology. And in that regard, they've spent almost $600,000 just in technology over the last few years addressing some of the data technology infrastructure within the district. And they still continue to plan uh, for the future as well. In addition, again, with, with aging facilities, you talk about roofs, you talk about air conditioning, uh, you talk about doors, you just talk about the asset in and of itself. We used to talk about this in terms of deferred maintenance. That's back when a district had about $1.50 per $100 value uh, on their in maintenance and operation budget to manage a district. That rate has been compressed so much now that the ability to put out substantial dollars to address maintenance needs and large capital expenditures has diminished quite a bit uh, statewide. And so we, it's really unfair to, to talk about it as deferred maintenance because it's not like a district is intentionally just putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. The funding left over after you pay teachers and you pay all the cost to operate a school district, that, that number that's left over is not quite as big. And so the district has been very um, aggressive in addressing capital needs over the last few years. And again, uh, with, with decisions made by the school board, uh, the district has put over almost $6 million into their facilities over the last few years addressing large capital needs. And as Mr. G said, we're getting to the point now where that's becoming a pretty substantial burden on the operating budget of the school district. And so to address the other needs, how do we get there? Well, that has led us to this planning process to help the district put a roadmap together for identifying what the needs are, what the priorities are, and how can we best address those in the short term and the long term. And so we started this process a few years ago by looking at um, the facilities in and of themselves. Uh, what's happened to enrollment? What are your capacities? Where do you have breathing room? Uh, where are you pinched in terms of capacities at some of the campuses? And where are programs um, and instructional spaces challenged in some way specific to the instructional model that they're trying to, um, to share with your students? As you look at the enrollment, a lot of this has to do with COVID. It, it tweaked a lot of uh, districts' analysis of where they were and where they're going. But you can see largely the district's been kind of flat for a few years. Uh, but a couple years ago, developers started showing up in Mr. G's office and coming to the school board and sharing with them plats for new developments in and around Kennedale. Um, a lot of them are multifamily. That brings new students. You guys get students in from other districts. And so we've seen some bubbles begin to come up around Kennedale ISD, which uh, given your current layout, or, or I would say current, your layout in 2020 of how your grade tiers were structured, we were seeing some a bit of a taxing on the schools and their capacities. And so we wanted to look at the historical enrollment, try to project where the district's going to go, and the demographer that was brought on in 2020, I think, demographer 2020, yeah, came in and did begin to project a gradual increase in student enrollment in the district. And so that led us down a, a path of how do we deal with this? At the same time, the state came down with the, another one of their, their fiats that you guys have to provide full day pre-K to your students. Well, at the time you were doing a half day program. And so to go to a full day program, now you need more spaces. And so if we want that program to go to grow, and we do, because I think the, uh, the administration here is, has been pretty aggressive about identifying where some of the weaknesses are with student performance, and obviously one of those is reading. And so if we can capture those students at an early age through pre-KK and first grade and put them on a good path for reading, once they begin to get, to get into the upper grades, their performance improves and the district performance improves overall. And so, 
we started taking a look at the facilities. And one of the things we do is we um, look at your existing facilities. Uh, we look at them with respect to what the administrative code says they should be in terms of size and function and how they perform for the specific instructional unit. And we look at how each classroom is assigned within each campus. And we begin to derive from that what your actual capacity is. Uh, there's a lot of factors that go into that. Uh, one of the things is we, we have to look at the core curriculum. I, I speak in terms of the, the four basic food groups. You've got math, ELA, social studies, and science. But then once you get into the secondary, you've got electives. You've got other programs that support uh, opportunities for your students. Um, we, have to be in, we have to be mindful, too, of the, the, the pullout programs and your special ed programs. You know, I see a few gray hairs in here, but you know, when I was in school, I remember we had the resource room. And if you were struggling, you went to the resource room. Um, now, having been in educational planning for the last 35 years, we've seen an evolution of ESL. We've seen diagnostics. We've seen speech therapy. We've seen content mastery, reading recovery, math recovery. Back in the day, tax recovery, now star recovery. Um, everything you can possibly do to take those students that are struggling and try to get them back online so that they can be successful. And those special programs require space. So they capture space within existing facilities that were never really designed for broad-based special ed. And so when you have as many as 8, 10, 12 pull-out programs in a campus that have captured full-size classrooms and only served two to three students a classroom period, your ability to serve a, a, a higher student enrollment is challenged. And so we want to understand how the buildings operate, and that's the part of the analysis we go through. And finally, I mentioned the administrative code. You know, back when I started in this business, the TEA had guidelines for what a classroom should be in the state of Texas. And it was a simple guideline, and we tried to adhere by those guidelines. Many legislative sessions ago, the, the legislature said, you know what, we're going to move that from the TEA's realm over to the administrative code, and we're going to make it law. And if you're going to design and build or substantially renovate a school building in the state of Texas, now you have to meet these guidelines. And the architect and contractor have to certify that that building meets uh, the administrative code, Title 19. Um, in November of last year, in the middle of our planning process, they changed their mind again. And so now, instead of saying a classroom should be 700 square feet uh, for general classrooms, and if you're in first grade, it needs to be 800 square feet, and if you're a science lab, you need to be 1,000 square feet, they've decided, well, let's talk about how you teach. And if you teach in a traditional format where you line the kids up in chairs and they look at a whiteboard, then this is how much square feet you need. But if you're going to integrate technology and you're going to use project-based learning, and you're going to have collaborative environment with other classrooms and other instructional units, then it could potentially be this many square feet. So what that if, what effectively means is what should have originally had perhaps been a 700 square foot facility now might need to be 1,100 square foot. And so it has a huge impact across the state on how uh, buildings are designed and or renovated. And so it's important to go through that analysis. When we did that, we looked at how we, we came up with an analysis of where your, your facilities were capacity-wise. Um, and I know I didn't hand this out. I see somebody taking a picture over there. This is all going to be posted uh, on the district website, so you'll have access to this data. Uh, but Delaney was pinched hard, uh, primarily because they, when we the, the school district demolished the pre-K wing uh, on the administrative campus, Delaney took those kids on. And uh, it really put a pinch on the capacity of that, capa of that facility. Patterson and Arthur had some room to breathe. Kennedale Junior High had some room to breathe, a lot of room to breathe, actually. And then Kennedale High School uh, has plenty of room for growth. But what, what really started, uh, the, what was really the catalyst to planning for the future was the full-day kindergarten. We could not put full-day kindergarten based on growth projections for any extended period of time at Delaney. So we needed to plan for that. And that process led us down a path of identifying what, what are our key objectives. First of all, we've got to be able to serve full-day pre-K, okay? That's the number one priority. 
We also recognize that through the process, we want to minimize the number of times that kids move campuses. Um, so many districts respond to bubbles in their enrollment, and they end up with a, a pre-K, a 1-2, a 3-4, a 5-6, you know, 7-8. And those kids, about the time they get comfortable on a campus and know the teachers and the teachers know them, we're packing them up and we're shipping them to another campus. And that's difficult for students, particularly in the formative years. We also wanted to be respectful of the, the history of, of having the Delaney and, and Patterson set up in the district. More importantly, we wanted to have good utilization of your facilities. We didn't want one campus to be overloaded and one campus to be used at 50%. We wanted effective utilization that helps from a staffing perspective, uh, it helps from an energy perspective when you've got good utilization of your facilities. And then finally, based on the data that was coming in on the new developments, we wanted the district to be able to respond to growth. We didn't want them to have to react to growth. We wanted them to be in a posture to be ready for growth when and if it happens. And so uh, I see a couple familiar faces in here. Uh, last summer, uh, early summer and through the summer, we had a, a large community group come together to review options of what makes good sense for Kennedale. And we had some good cussing and discussing. Let me tell you, it was, it was fun for me to go through that process. Um, we had great input from folks, great input from parents, great input from staff. We looked at everything from let's go build a new pre-K center, which if you think about it, looking at those earlier capacity numbers would be great for pre-K, but it, it emptied a lot of space in existing facilities. It wasn't real efficient. Um, we looked at a pre-K-5 setup acro across the district. Delaney, Patterson, and Arthur all becoming pre-K-5. Kids don't move for a, a good number of years. But there's just something to, hard to wrap my, your, your, your head around when you talk about two pre-K-5 campuses within a, a short, short par four from each other didn't make a lot of sense and how do you draw that attendance zone it's kind of crazy we looked at you know one two and three grade campuses but again that goes back to keeping those kids as long as you can on a home base and not move them around as much all those options didn't really address all of those key objectives that we set out to meet uh, in the beginning and so we ended up with eventually it was our fifth option which was to take Arthur and make it a pre-K through one campus and take Delaney and Patterson to make them two through five campuses. Uh, that did a lot for all the objectives that we were looking at. Now I know in the interim it, it creates some challenges, but long term that puts the district in the best posture. So what we did is we said, all right, we're gonna take that data from the task force, we're gonna go back to staff, we're gonna review those options and say, all right, if we're gonna do this at Arthur, what exactly are we gonna have to modify to support that early childhood education. If we're gonna push sixth grade over to the junior high, um, what modifications do we make there to support those additional students? Ultimately, we prepared some recommendations for the school board, which we made, and the school board gave us some, uh, some direction. There were specific improvements that were going to require some design elements, <clears throat> so we went through the process of procuring, the board gave us authority to go through the process of securing an architect and engineering team to go through that design process with us, focusing primarily on Arthur and the junior high. Now, one thing I'd like to touch on, um, and some of you guys have been part of this process, is what exactly does a pre-K classroom look like? What you're seeing here is what a lot of your pre-K classrooms look like I'll be a little neater, I think. Um, you guys have a lot of manip manipulatives. They're great spaces to walk into. But this is traditional. Nowadays, um, to engage those students, and again, think about these kids. I don't know if any of you have grandkids, but if you hand your four-year-old your iPhone, it's gonna come back with 17 new apps on it, and you have no idea, or I don't have any idea how they put them on there. But now, early childhood is an engaged environment. It provides multiple experiences for those young kids. Um, it's hands-on, it's get dirty, it's play a little bit, it's see some real life activity related to, related to a specific learning uh, objective. And so the spaces are different, they're larger, we have utilities in those spaces, the kids are allowed to, to engage and move around from space to space. 
we may have kids in one classroom one day with a certain theme and we move them to a different classroom the next day and so it's a very engaging uh, environment all for the, the sole purpose of getting those kids engaged early and making them successful in their later years so we came up with a great plan we uh, we got board approval we put out an RFQ we uh, had some firms provide their statements of qualifications, went through an interview process. We uh, elected to bring Huckabee Architecture on board, started a design process, had some great ideas on how are we going to create these new inviting larger spaces at Arthur, which right now has a lot of small spaces. So we're talking about tearing down walls and things like that. And it was a great process. Staff was involved. We were coming up with some great ideas. And then earlier this year, we, we blew a line. Uh, the fire riser coming into uh, Arthur, ruptured after 20 years, I guess, flooded the entire first floor, made a mess, had some structural impacts, and it, it kind of brought everything to a screeching halt. Uh, but we responded. Uh, we responded, and we thought about, again, looking at that long-range planning strategy let's keep things on track we've got to address the structural issues at, at Arthur we've got to address the uh, the long-term design considerations but we also have to be mindful of the other challenges that exist around the district you've got some roofs that are aged that are leaking that weren't part of the capital expenditures previously that need to be addressed you've got air conditioning units around the district that are 25 years old that are hanging on by a thread when you think about the infrastructure associated with that, um, and you can do this in just about any community, you can ask who has the most people under roof every day, who feeds the most people every day, who transports the people, most people every day, and in almost every community, it's a school district. You guys have a tremendous amount of infrastructure that to maintain uh, on an ongoing basis. So when you think about how many air conditioning units are involved district-wide, it's quite a bit. And the district has made those investments over time, but it's really just one at a time. We lose one, we're replacing it, that type of thing. So we have to plan for the future. In addition, you know, I, and I come from the big town of Bremont, Texas, and I still have to walk into a vestibule and hand my driver's license to Lynn that I've known for 25 years, and she scans it and gives me my sticker to go into the school. Um, but that's the, that's the nature of the beast, and that's the, uh, you know, the society, unfortunately, we live in. No matter how small or big your community is, unfortunately, we have to think that way. Safety and security is a big thing. To couple that with the new state mandates, and there's no telling what might come out after these, but now school districts are mandated for fencing, for bullet, bulletproof glass and or film on all exterior windows, um, you know, I'm, I'm anxious, I'm scared, I'm nervous, I'm a little apprehensive about what it's going to make our schools and communities look like, but we have to protect our babies. We've got to be responsible about it. But those new mandates are coming down. When you think about fencing the high school and keeping the kids safe but still allowing access for the community and parents, that's a bear. Think about all the schools. Think about Delaney, the way it's sitting there, contiguous with the you know, administrative campus, so those are some animals that we have to tackle as well. Pile on top of that, 20 plus years of, of age, of wear and tear, of growth, of uh, slight modifications to all of your facilities. And there's a long list of capital needs district wide that need to be considered in any planning effort going forward. So with that, after the travesty of, of Arthur, um, it kind of played our hand for us. It forced the district to move those kids around, to get them out of Arthur, move um, fourth and fifth grade down, push sixth grade to the, to the junior high, uh, and it's made a lot of folks uncomfortable. So we have to be able to deal with that. We're moving forward. We move forward prematurely, but, you know, forced. Um, with the water leak to implement the realignment. Um, we have moved forward with upgrades at the, at the junior high. We've addressed the old dressing rooms in the, old, in the, the original gym. Uh, we've worked on, we're working on the secure vestibules. 
would, you probably wouldn't be surprised how hard it is to get bulletproof glass right now, but that's what we're waiting on. Um, we addressed restrooms, obviously with adding the sixth grade there, we wanted to make sure we had enough restroom facilities, so we made a lot of modifications to the junior high. We actually poured concrete on the slab that we replaced at, at Arthur that uh, had the structural damages. Uh, we've got our pre-construction tomorrow with the contractor that's gonna come in and do all the renovation work. So we're gonna get Arthur done in time for school next year. That's moving forward. In addition, we've continued our ongoing planning efforts um, and trying to identify capital improvements throughout the district. After the realignment, this is what your capacities look like. Um, the Laney dropped substantially until we had to move <laughs> the grades over there because of Arthur. But in, in the perfect world, this is where it stand, this is where we, we end up. One of the biggest challenges and the largest concern is Kennedale Junior High. Um, I think we're still predicting growth at that campus, and so we've always planned on addition to that campus, and I'll speak to that here in just a minute. But our, our goal again is to put the district in a posture to respond to growth, not react to the growth. Um, so what we did late last uh, summer was send out surveys to all the campuses. These surveys allowed staff members at all of the campuses to go through their buildings literally room by room, uh, from janitorial closets to classrooms to the cafeteria to the kitchen to the band hall to exterior gutters and sidewalks and parking and lighting, you name it. Go through in great detail the components of their facility and decide whether it needs improvement or if it's, if it's adequate. Um, and then we provide mechanisms for comments back and feedback. We got a ton of color comments back. Some were very entertaining. Some were very intuitive, you know, from folks that are in those buildings day to day. And they were very helpful in giving us a foundation for moving forward. So we took those, those summaries as kind of the launching pad to go through the campuses and do our own technical assessments. As we go through these things, we look at code compliance. Um, we look at all components relative to the facilities and uh, literally, we're counting doorknobs that aren't ADA compliant. Uh, we're looking at finishes. We're looking at life cycle costs. We're looking at, um, you know, 20 year old VCT floor tile that has to be stripped and waxed every year and cleaned consistently. Um, and now you can see that the joints are beginning to separate. And you, you just, it, they look great. They're shiny, but you can tell they're old. They've been cleaned a lot. Same thing with ceiling tile, lighting upgrades. Uh, we still have fluorescent lighting throughout a lot of the district. It's just things like that that we try to identify. We think about, a, I guess it's 24th century now learning environments. What is it? What does it look like? And how can it be engaging, inviting, and, and supportive to your student population? So we prepared those laundry lists for all of the campuses uh, <clears throat> to, to set the foundation for where the, the, strate the strategy may go. So this is the sticker shock here. Uh, when we went through the campuses and, and we, we totaled up the, the capital needs for each one of the campuses, this is what we're looking at. Um, one of the things that I wanna bring your attention to is uh, the safety and security, which is the last thing on the top half there. You know, again, this is driven largely by the state criteria uh, that's been put out, uh, but we're also talking about things like parking lot lighting. You come to a meeting out here at night, and you go outside, it's pretty well lit here, but if you're behind the high school, the junior high at night, it's pretty dark. And so we want to create a little safer environment for, for staff to come in and out um, in after hours work. It's things like that. It's card key access, it's security cameras. Um, it's a wide range of safety improvements to allow your safety director and his staff to make sure that the campuses are as safe as they can possibly be. This number includes the film on the windows. It includes um, the, uh, the, the completing the secure vestibules, card key access, those types of things district-wide. So uh, I know it's a big number. Going through here also, we looked at some initiatives. Uh, Patterson folks, you guys survive with the smallest library in the galaxy. Uh, We've, we've included a new library in this for Patterson, which allows some of that interior space to be converted to classrooms. Uh, the high school, 
Career and technology is, you know, they, they've implemented a lot of career and technology initiatives, but they're confined by the spaces that they have within that campus. We've included a culinary lab in this. Uh, a lot of school districts have gone the culinary route to create opportunities for students uh, in a commercial kitchen, kitchen setup. At the junior high, we've got a large addition in here for, it's a science and multi-purpose wing. We've got a, your science labs are adequate, but they don't meet the current standards, let alone future standards, and so we've, we've, we're looking at an addition to the facility that includes science labs for all three grades, new art rooms for all three grades, multi-purpose rooms for all three grades, and standardized classrooms. It adds a capacity of about 375 to 400 students to that campus, which will serve the district for years to come. And so that's in these numbers as well. Um, the second half of this is just to kind of give you guys an idea of the impact. I talked a little bit earlier about infrastructure. When you think about the footprint that Kennedale ISD has on this community, and you talk about replacing probably 70% of the units that haven't been touched in 20 years, you're looking at about a little over $15 million just to replace that air conditioning, okay? Um, we've got about $8 million in roofing at multiple campuses. Uh, there's other security and, and safety elements in, in the overall campus analyses. Just restrooms. If you look at the restrooms that were built 20 plus years ago, they need some loving. Um, it's not just a matter of keeping them clean. It's a matter of the finishes that were put in at the time they were constructed that are just worn out. And so we're, we're looking at going in and replacing those, those uh, facilities. We're also looking at, I'll be honest, you know, finishes. Um, the, the facilities at the time they were built were adequate, they were, they were great. They require continuous maintenance from the maintenance department in terms of patching walls, painting, replacing floor tile, uh, replacing base molding, replacing ceiling tile. They're just aged, and so what, what we included in the analysis was providing, as an example, some tile wainscot in the, in the corridors to provide some stability, some long-term maintenance uh, relief, I guess is a good word, um, good floor finishes, good tile now, the technology has come. I wish they didn't call it, I'll, I'll just say LVT, but they call it luxury vinyl tile. It's horrible when you're trying to convince folks in schools to spend money, but you guys that have used it in your in your real life know that it is a, it's a incredibly durable, durable tile that doesn't have to be stripped and waxed every year. You damp mop it and you're good to go. So that cuts down on labor, cuts down on cleaning, those types of things. So as we went through the process, uh, we tried to take a comprehensive approach. We looked at modern science labs, modern art rooms, things like that uh, within uh, the facilities. We've got the culinary lab at the high school, the library at Patterson. The big element of this was improving the building envelope. When we talk about that, we're talking about the roofing, we're talking about the windows and the doors and that type of thing. Uh, new durable uh, finishes. Our goal in this was not just to spend money. It, when you think about just the lighting, just replacing the lighting with LED lighting goes a long way to reducing your life cycle cost and your ongoing energy cost. And so we're trying to take these buildings that, are, that weren't really built um, in a time where the energy code is so aggressive, they weren't, it's very aggressive now, but we looked at how can we change these buildings to be more efficient, more energy efficient, and not such an annual burden on the maintenance budget to try to maintain and replace equipment. And then finally, as I said a couple of times, is just put the district in a posture to respond to the growth when it happens. Let's get the, the additions done, get the students situated, and then when the growth comes, now it's just a matter of adding a section here to, you know, adding another grade to, to first or this, but we're not looking at large scale additions, renovations, or moving kids more um, around the community. So with all of that data, and I know it's, I gave you a lot and probably created more questions than I actually did answer any, um, what we want you to help us do is establish some priorities. Those numbers that I shared with you earlier were literally built on a line item by line item basis. And so what we would like to do is give you guys access to a, a web-based survey that allows you to go through and prioritize how important is lighting upgrades to you? How important is it for, to see uh, improvements in drainage and erosion in and around the high school or 
uh, addressing the roofing issues or the HVAC issues or adding a culinary lab to the high school. We let you guys decide uh, in a survey what's important to you. That will allow us to take those numbers and put them into categories based on priorities for you to evaluate. And then we'll sit down together with those priorities, with those detailed numbers, and begin to look at what opportunities are there for Kennedale ISD, what challenges are there, and how do we address those. Um, with all of that, then we'll take that data and we'll say, how much is this going to cost us if we do this? Um, as you know, the district has some debt. Um, is this something we can continue to fund out of, out of operating budgets over a 5, 10, 15 year strategy? Is this something where we want to implement some type of debt instrument to cover some of these costs? Um, if we do, what does that mean? Is that an m and increase? Is that an INS increase? Uh, and we'll get into the details of funding uh, at a later meeting. I think Mr. G has some information to share with you. And we'll talk about timing. Um, when and if do we want to make something happen? And finally, hopefully with your help, we'll formulate some recommendations to take to the school board. Uh, as community members, community leaders, you can say these are our priorities, this is what we think you need to tackle now, and this is how we think you can do it, and, and we support it. And so it's a team effort. We, we put a lot of work together to get the data for you guys to analyze as the end users and the guys that might foot the bill for it to tell us what's important to you uh, and help us move forward with the school board. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, ma'am. Good question. We actually have it programmed out. So as part of that program, and I'm shooting from the hip, but I, I'll give you guys the details at the next meeting. We have six science labs in there, and these are lab classroom combinations. They're about 1,400 square feet, including, that doesn't include, but in addition to the prep areas for each one of those laboratories, okay? We've got three real art rooms set aside for each grade level at the campus. Uh, we have a couple of multi-purpose rooms because, I, I, you know, it seems like every time we walk into a school, there's a new opportunity, new initiative. Maybe it's robotics. Maybe it's whatever it is. So we, we want some labs that are available for those types of programs. And you can actually push CTE all the way down to the middle school. So if something, if an opportunity presents itself, we want the district to have those spaces available. Um, and then finally, we've added four additional standardized classrooms in there. So we've increased... Once we move to that, then we could take the existing science labs and make those classrooms uh, or, or whatever. Uh, and based on our analysis, it's, it's a, between 375 and 400 additional students that the, that the campus could support in, the, in addition to what they have now. Yeah. Yes, sir. You bet. Yeah, great question. That's uh, one of the things we have. We've, we're still working on the framework of the survey, but we'll have the. We're probably not. It doesn't make sense to look at our, have a survey for each campus, because I don't want to pit Delaney against Patterson or that type of thing. If they both have lighting upgrades, either you support lighting upgrades or you don't. You can't support it for Patterson and not support it for Delaney. So we'll probably synchronize those things. But then we will have, do you have any specific comments, ideas, questions, concerns? It doesn't necessarily have to be something that you want to add. It's just a question you may have. There will be components for each one of the campuses for you to be able to ask a question or provide some feedback on something specific you'd like us to look at. And that's what we'll try to go through and have prepared for the next meeting. Yes, sir. So uh, Kennedale is relatively landlocked. Yes. Um, 
the few developments that have come in have been multifamily. So there's, there's every bit of a likelihood that you will see some growth. Um, and you may have some transfers that come in as well. I forget your transfer policy and how many you have coming in. But that's, that's a possibility as well. There's nothing on the radar that signifies substantial growth. That's why we haven't planned for any additional facilities, if you will. What we're looking at now is only additions to support your current and next five to 10 years worth of enrollment, okay? Um, we'll monitor that and continue to monitor that. But our grade structure, and you saw the capacities that you get at both your elementaries, will last you for years. Um, likewise, with the addition to the junior high, you'll have capacity for years. And at your high school, you already have the capacity. So we're trying to put you in a posture of being able to respond to that growth. Now, I, I say that when we, when we did um, Hearst Jules Bedford's bond in 1997, the demographer said, you guys are a sleeping giant. And that's come to fruition now, 25 years later. What has happened is all of those old seasoned citizens have retired or moved on to the great beyond, and now they're starter homes. And a district that was landlocked and built out is, is finding itself really with some capacity challenges. That's not on the foreseeable horizon in Kennedale. But, uh, so an answer to your question is twofold. One is deal with capacity challenges you have right now, but more importantly, deal with the capital needs that you have in terms of big ticket items like roofing, uh, air conditioning, some of those items as well. That, did I answer you? you yeah, what did I miss? Okay. Yes, exactly. And that's why we would do what? Uh, you know, if you if if the district ticks up an enrollment, it's the projections show that we're well within the five years. It, we're we're out there a ways. We we we've given you capacity for quite a while. Yes, sir. No, no, I don't, I don't think we could. The 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 buildings as they were designed don't meet that criteria, so I don't think we could. We can get close. And, and honestly, that's what we do with a lot of the facilities. To get LEED certification tax on a ton of additional cost, um, and you can get just about everything in there without getting the stamp, but the energy code in and of itself pushes everybody almost towards LEED certification. It's, it's crazy. Yes, sir. No, I didn't say that. Campus committees? Oh, no, they've, they've been a part of the process. The campuses have been a part of giving us the data. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, I would say in terms of our survey, I don't want to put paint Delaney on there and paint Patterson. And somebody said, well, I'll paint Patterson. I'm not paint Delaney. I don't want to do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's a great question. We have uh, some information for you to take home tonight, which, if you can understand it, then you get to speak at the next meeting. No, uh, you know, I, I've been doing this a long time, and school finance has gotten to the point where it is very difficult to understand. Uh, the challenges that a school district has, essentially the school district doesn't control the money that they get anymore. Um, the state says this is how much you get, and you have to work within that. Um, the only thing a district can control is their debt service, and they still have to work within a certain limit uh, mandated by the state. 
Um, so there's good information to share. When we compile all of this, we'll speak to that specifically at, at one of the subsequent meetings. Uh, but right now, the operating budget, I think, is about 31 million. Yeah. Yes, sir. You mean the first report? Yeah. say that in in the safety and security is a uh, we have a operation center included in that um, the capacity to centralize controls communications and response to any type of event uh, is becoming more and more important so we've included a facility in there for that it's about a I think I've got 3,000 square foot facility with a garage on it um, but in terms of new educational facilities, other than culinary and the addition to the middle school and the library at Patterson, that's really the only new structures we have. The district has a good footprint to support their student population, um, but the, the middle school is taxed right now, forcing sixth grade up there before we get the addition on. Uh, and it makes sense if you're going to, to go in and do an addition like that, rather than just adding classrooms, let's identify what spaces, they don't meet the standards, so why don't we build those new spaces and then convert the others to classroom? And that's what led us down the path to that. But uh, no, there's no new facilities. It's really not a need. That's, that's, that's the issue. Yes, sir. It depends how many students come in you know and I that's a great question because a lot of times people come in they go well, they're building 700 homes well that doesn't necessarily mean 700 students sometimes it's 0. 0.2 students per household in something like that yes Thank you. 
me let me jump back to this slide here. If you guys look at this, and maybe this will go a little ways to easing some of your concerns. If you look at this slide, you look at Delaney and Patterson. With the move, Delaney will have 16 empty classrooms. That's over 300 kids that they could carry in addition to what they have. Okay, so our, our process was to try to make it as efficient as we can. Patterson will have 12. That includes taking eight full-size classrooms at Delaney and making them special ed and nine at Patterson and making them special ed. So we've tried again to, to think about what's a good decision in 2023 that's going to be still a good decision, you know, in 2030, 2033. Um, and I think the realignment uh, and the addition at the middle school and moving pre-K through one, you still have the capacity of pre if the pre-K, pre-K one becomes just overburdened with young students, which only helps performance later. Then it's just a matter of shifting first grade to the other campuses. They already have the room. So we've got some some cushion in here to to deal with growth in the short term and I think midterm, long term. If you see it, then we're looking at property to build another you know an element, elementary campus. So. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, you could build on stills. Great plan. Again, that's exactly what we're looking for out of this is some of those, because we've already talked about the acquisition of another elementary campus somewhere. I'd say we, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but again, that's, it's not about, you guys are all grown ups. The B word's gonna come up eventually, but that's not really what this is about. This is about how do we address the issues we have now within the funding we have or some type of debt instrument, but keep us in a posture to respond to growth when it comes and on that horizon, hey, have we thought about having a piece of property for another campus, whether it's junior high or, or, or uh, elementary? So, yes, ma'am. If we that's a great question. Mm -hmm. If if we said go today, we would be lucky to have. Just figure two years. If we said go today, it's two years to get that building designed, bid out, and constructed. And the, and the addition to um, take that, Patterson, and the, the culinary. You're, you're looking at junior high as a solid 12-month project, any way you slice it. Uh, culinary is probably about the same. The library, you know, eight to 12 months. But you're also talking about a solid six to eight months worth of design. The key is not to rush it. Everything we've done has engaged your staff and your community and we would do the same thing with the design. What does the science lab look like? So that's gonna take a little longer. Yeah. Right. Like it's two years. Just figure two years. I just think it would be nice for whoever is specifically designing the program to have a couple of months to design the program. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Because it might extend prioritization and Good question. Yes, ma'am. Yes, 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 and no. <laughs> um, so as part of the analysis, the capacity analysis, 
um, we recognized we had room at the middle school. Arthur happened, sixth grade gets shot over there. Um, we had planned to do that anyway in a, in a slightly less painful method or process. Um, but in doing so, in moving sixth grade over there, we knew we would have capacity challenges. And so we looked at the spaces within the middle school or junior high that um, were perhaps not necessarily complementing instruction as well as they could. And so science labs were, to me, an obvious one, particularly when you dump sixth grade over there. Um, and then the art rooms were just, they were responses to the need, and they were taken out, put in spaces that weren't really intended to be art rooms to begin with. And so those are, to me, pull those out, let's put those in addition and put these other ones back as classrooms. And then let's think about the other additional spaces we might need, which is hence the, the multi-purpose and the standardized classrooms that we've included in the, in the plan. So it's, it's threefold. It's one, it's addressing spaces that don't meet the guidelines. They don't even meet 1999 guidelines, let alone 2022 guidelines. And two, put the, the campus in a little better posture with respect to capacity. <clears throat> This, this snapshot was based on existing spaces in the building. It doesn't count the addition. So when we add those in there, that whole dynamic is going to change for you. Well, no, a, a new band hall was not considered. But if that's something that needs to be considered, let us know, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. with different degrees of expertise on their instruments, right? Right, right. <laughs> yes, sir. A, that's a great question. I, I will say very seldom will you spend more on a renovation than you will new. Um, uh, even still, I mean, you know, most buildings are designed for a, they call it a 40-year life, okay? How many of the systems in any building last 40 years? They don't. Your mechanical systems are going to start conking out in 10 to 15 years. That's just going to happen. 
your roof, you'll be lucky if you get 15 years out of that. Heaven forbid a hailstorm comes in or something like that. So realistically, reinvesting in, in, a, in infrastructure um, is, is an ongoing element of any school district around the state. Um, Delaney and Arthur, the original structures and even some of the additions, I mean, they're tilt wall construction. They're solid concrete, um, not particularly sexy. Um, in fact, Delaney, some of the, most of the classrooms are pretty small. But if we can keep those student-teacher ratios down by having an appropriate number of classrooms, then you could make that work. And if we can change the learning environment to make it a little more inviting, um, then we do that. But whether or not, even if you build the new building, you're going to put LED lighting in it. So going back to an older facility and putting LED lighting in it only improves your energy cost. So you've got to look at, you know, for instance, eight and a half million in Delaney versus um, what would probably be on the order of 40 million to replace it, you know? Yeah. Yes, sir. No, we're we're going through and and we've we're addressing every unit that's 15 years or older. Now, and this that's a great point because when we look at priorities, the district has invested in, in units as they've gone down, and we've got an inventory of all the units that are left, and so we looked at those, and that's how we've come up with our estimates on replacing that. Some of them, you know, they're 17, 18 years old. You might squeak eight years out of it. Do you replace it now or do you go ahead and milk it? And maybe say, let's cut that HVAC number down to six million or seven million and fix the ones that are your problem child and then we'll deal with the rest when we need to down the road. That's, when we talk about priorities, that's some of the stuff we're talking about. Um, but it is a wholesale remove and replace.
Yes, ma'am. Those are the, no ma'am, I think we're going to, we would allow the economy and the market to sort of drive that. The additions, fortunately, can be done fairly simply without largely impacting the school environment. The renovations are, are going to have to be done in phases because we're going to go in and we're going to tear out a lot of stuff and replace a lot of stuff. And so we will likely tackle all the campuses over multiple summers to get that done. So it'll be, our goal is to make Miss Mode's life as miserable as we can for about three years, you know, taking everything down and putting it back. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. So give you want a ability to say we um, I'm s so yeah um, the the idea is and I put this slide up here for you guys to look at I hope you can read it but I mean, we literally went line by line at each one of the campuses. This is out of the high school, so we're talking about if you've, if you've taken the time to walk around the entire perimeter of the high school, um, you, you see that they've got some drainage issues, they've got some really bad erosion issues, sidewalks need to be taken out and replaced. Um, so my question to you guys is, as the survey, I wanted, I, we were thinking of keeping it general and saying, you know, replace deteriorated or cracked concrete and address drainage and erosion. 
is that a priority to you? Not, we have 1,200 feet at X dollars a foot for this much money. And here's why, and I'm open to your feedback. If you have a need, it's a need. Um, the best example I have of this is we, when we put Hershey's Beverage Bond pro proposal together, it was $151 million. The board choked on it. Of course, that was 1997. That was a lot of money. They said, send those surveys back to the campuses and tell, they tell them that we, they need to cut it, take out the stuff that they don't need. Every campus, all 26 campuses said, take out the fire alarm and the fire sprinkler system. We don't need it. <laughs> so, but, and they based, that, they based that decision on the dollars, you know, well, we, don't need to, we don't need to spend that much money on fire sprinkler system, but you really don't have a choice. So where I'm going with that is what I, what I hate folks to do is make a decision based on the dollar amount. And here's how we structure the, the survey. You get three choices. Priority one, got to have it. Our district needs this right now. Two, absolutely need it. But you know what? We can live without it for a little while. Or three, it's not even on my radar. I don't care. And when we put it in that context, it's amazing how things float to the surface of what's really important to you guys. Now, there may be some things that you decide the it comes out as a priority three, and I know the code's going to require us to do it. It's going to have to be in there, but those are few and far between. So what, I'm, what I'd like to do is create that survey so that you guys can talk about the components of your facilities that are important to you. HVAC, we know there's soft costs associated. I say we know. It's intuitive to me, but you're right. Not everybody knows that. But HVAC, lighting, roofing, drainage, parking, security lighting, safety and security district-wide, and, and let you decide what those are in terms of priorities. We'll take those numbers, put them back into our line item cost, and at the next meeting, I'll give you all of the line items and how they ferret it out with priorities, and then we'll break you guys up and let you all talk amongst yourselves about, okay, now that we see the numbers with the priorities, does it make good sense or do we want to tweak it a little bit? And by God, if we're going to do that, let's add a band hall or let's do something here. So again, it's not, I'm not coming to you trying to sell you on $87 million. I'm saying this is a starting point and we need to work together to, to take that number and plot it out as to how we're going to try to tackle it. So, yes, ma'am. You took a long time there to steal my thunder. <laughs> yeah, you notice in the email it was it was TBD. That was the idea. Is we the next meeting we'll likely have at Delaney or Patterson or one of those other campuses. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. Yes, sir. See, I told you people would pay attention to this. <laughs> no, that's a great, great question. The, what we've actually done is the district, as part of the renovation of, Wal of Arthur, is putting almost $4 million into that campus. The insurance is paying for another million and a half, two million, numbers give or take. So the reimbursement is really only for the first floor of the two-story section. 
The rest of it, the district committed out of fund balance to address, okay? So what we've included in here, and if, if you guys set it as a priority, is we would ask the board to do what's called a resolution to reimburse. And we've included that reimbursement, that 3.7 or 3.8 million in our estimate for Arthur. And so that when and if you incur some debt to, to pay off things, we would take that and reimburse the district's fund balance. So that's in that number. That's a, I'm glad you picked that up. Thank you for that, because that's, that's a big part of it. We thought about reimbursing the district's um, fund balance with some type of indebt some type of debt service. And that's the three point seven point seven or seven million that it five years from now reasons from now that contract could come back to fund balance and that could be Yeah. It could. Yeah, I, but I, that's that's just the nature of the beast. I, I can I was laughing with a colleague the other day when we started this we were planning buildings for fifty five to sixty dollars a square foot. And, and going back to that 97 program at HEB, we put $11 million into LD Bell High School, okay? We found the original contract. 11 million just renovations. We did out of band hall, but the rest was renovation. 11 million, they built it. 200,000 square feet, they built it in 1960 for $2 million, $10 a foot. So yeah, is it gonna go up? Yeah, but that's interest rates, everything, everything's going up, but uh, I don't want, that's not a catalyst to try to make a decision now. It's, um, you know, we want to make good sound decisions for the kids of Kennedale and for taxpayers of Kennedale, and I want to give you the data to look at and let you guys filter through it. Yes, sir. So that is a typo. So I, I, we were feverishly working on some things right before the deal, and I had stuff in safety and security, some lighting, fencing, and some other things. And then, is Johnny here? Yeah, troublemaker over there uh, had some really good ideas. I say good ideas. Some of them were mandated by the state. And so I fixed those. We created its own category up top. And I forgot to take the line item down there. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, I sincerely appreciate your your comments, your questions, your feedback. Uh, we will have a survey out to you. And my goal is tomorrow. If not, it'll be Monday. I think we talked about revising the second meeting for the 17th. Uh, that gives us time to get your feedback, revise the numbers, compile them, and have the bloody details for you guys to look at at that meeting. At that meeting, I think what we'd like to do is um, take those priorities and let you chew on them a little bit in, in a small group setting, kind of break you guys up and talk as, as colleagues, as hopefully friends and neighbors, and, and Help us look at options and opportunities. Uh, we will possibly even have some tax impact numbers by that time. Um, but um, that's our goal. All righty? So make sure you have your emails down. Yes, ma'am. So, 
we can do that. And I have about 4,000 pictures that we could also, um, I can send everybody a Dropbox link that you could open up every campus and look at the photos we've taken of every campus too. Yeah. Well, Having worked with your stellar administrators, I have to say you have to be careful what you ask for. But I, we will engage each one of the principals to help walk their respective campuses and show you some of their specific challenges and their successes and, and things that they, they love about their campuses as well. So that's a great idea. Yeah. It's a great point. Only when it rains. format of the, the survey, we will prepare a link to all of our photos by campus. And just as a kind of a teaser, you guys can look through those at your leisure, keep your eyes peeled for a survey. In the meantime, if we can put a video together of each campus with the campus administrator talking about their, their stuff. Uh, but I, you know, at the same time, I don't want to diminish the fact that um, w the way we approach these is we, we look at the facilities, we lay, we, we lay them out, and then we take your 
your goals and your objectives and we say now do the spaces complement that do they augment that or do they handicap it and if they handicap it where are the opportunities and what do we need to do to fix that and and i got to take my hat off to your, your staff does a great job of working within the spaces that they have but as i use my handprint example education ain't what it used to be and um, it's a challenge the the bar changes seems like every year um, and it's beneficial when you have a space that has lighting good air technology you know perhaps even some plumbing and electricity heaven forbid we have too much electricity in a classroom um, but those are those are things we got to talk about so i appreciate your time thank you for your input keep your eyes peeled you want to set it for do we do we decide the 17th good at The what? Well, we talked about shifting that. Yeah. So the one next Thursday is the one that this is the one that we want to see the seventeenth and the the seventeenth and then that way we can come and see the other way we can come and see the other one and then the one and the seventeenth is the Okay. We're going to pile it all on top of you. I can move way faster, but if, if you guys can put those videos together pretty quickly, and it's not, we're not talking a lot in terms of videos, just some shots. In addition to the photos, uh, we can hold off until middle of next week on the surveys and let you guys put those videos together. End of next week? Yeah. And we'll hold off on sending out the survey until we know the videos have been sent. The, it shouldn't take you longer than five or ten minutes to do the survey. Anybody that has an email or that wasn't able to show up tonight will get links to all of this and still have an opportunity to participate. Yeah, it's just a matter of putting the numbers in and sorting. We can do that pretty quick. Yeah. We didn't even have this presentation at 3 o'clock today. It's been crazy afternoon. I'm kidding. Is there an opportunity for people to ask questions after the survey? Yes. Everybody will have uh, Mr. G's email when it comes out. I'm on the email as well, but we'll put a line item in there because you, I – that's a great question because I may say replace EWC and you'll go, what's an EWC? Well, to me, it's an electrical water cooler. So I'm going to work on the survey acronyms and things like that. My email will be a sp specific line in the text. And if there's something that you don't understand about what's included in that email, I would prefer you to reply to all. That way, when I respond to you to all, everybody's hearing what I'm, what I'm saying. We'll just keep working as a team, though. 